Let's get into it, my friends. We have a lot to discuss. Everyone's going crazy about Saturday's main event. Let me first start with this. I have a lot to say about Saturday's event. Let me first start with this. I bet that you think that I'm going to start today's show waxing poetic, getting all crazy, talking about the main event, and in particular, the scoring from one particular judge, Mike Bell, fifth round, 10-8, Alexa Grasso, in the end, it's a split draw. Alexa Grasso retains against Valentina Shevchenko. I bet you think I'm going to go on and on and 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 just talk ad nauseum about this. I'm going to be a little bit annoying to some. I'm going to be grading. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to harp on it. I'm going to talk about open score. I bet you all think that I'm going to do that. And there is a time in this show that I will do that. But I feel inclined to start today's show like so. I thought Saturday night was one of the greatest bright spots in recent UFC history. I'm talking the last four, five, six years. That was a grand slam. That was one of the best things that the Ultimate Fighting Championship has done, in my opinion, in quite some time. They have done some really great things, but this one was a little bit unexpected. I thought that whole week from the buildup to the Friday outdoor weigh-ins, which felt different, which felt special, to all the vignettes, to the broadcasts itself, to the actual fights, the card, and then, of course, you know, the big main event, I thought it couldn't have gone better for the UFC. Now, I'm speaking to the people now who recognize that the UFC, they're not the ones who pick the judges. They're not the ones who assign officials. They don't do the scorecards. There are some people who know that. Unfortunately, there are some who don't. So I know that there may be a bit of a black cloud on the event now because there's a lot of people who disagree with the scoring. However, let us please recognize and acknowledge the fact that that Saturday night, that event, that feeling, that atmosphere, that environment is why I suspect a lot of you, and I could certainly say myself, fell in love with this sport. I fell in love with MMA, and I've said this before, because of the emotion, because of the passion, because of how unique it is, because of the buildup, because of the, the tension, because of the stories, because of the characters, because of the, 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 the hoopla, and the pageantry, that's why I fell in love with MMA. I don't think it's it's bad to admit that. I was a pro wrestling fan. I stumbled upon this thing, which felt like pro wrestling, but ultimately was real and was unpredictable and had great characters and great rivalries and great tension and great crescendos, and I fell in love with it. I've talked about being in Montreal, watching GSP beat Matt Hughes back in 2006 and saying like, wow, look at this passion. Look at what this means to people. Look at how this makes people feel. I want to be a part of that. I want to cover this. I remember watching the early days when it was really hard to find the pay-per-views. I remember staying up late for Pride and what was bigger than that and falling in love with the Mirko Krokops of the world and, and, and being enamored with the, the likes of Antonio Rodrigo Noguera and Fyodor Emelianenko and so many others. That's why I fell in love with this sport. Now, the fights are great. The fights are amazing. The skill, the athleticism, how tough it is, the heart, the will, the determination, that's amazing. But if you strip away all the other stuff, yeah, you know, you could watch uh, kickboxing reruns on ESPN2 at 1 a.m. Those were available. I never really watched those as a kid because it meant nothing. It didn't elicit anything. It didn't create anything. I didn't feel anything when I watched those. It's when I fell in love with MMA and the UFC in particular, and then I started watching Pride and all this other stuff. I was like, holy shit, this is special. This is different. This feels like a big deal. By God, Saturday felt like a big deal. It felt special. You, 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 you saw the emotion, not only in the fighters, not only in, 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 in the likes of Tracy Cortez and, and Alexa Grasso and Lupi Godinez and uh, Raul Rosas Jr. Like you felt it. You understood what this meant. And let's be honest, it wasn't even the best possible Noche UFC card that they could put together. It didn't have Yair Rodriguez. It didn't have Brandon Moreno. It didn't have Brian Ortega, arguably the three most popular fighters from that region, right? Um, it, it didn't even have those names and it still felt like a big deal. And the numbers in terms of the attendance, in terms of the gate were pay-per-view level, the vibe, the atmosphere, the environment that felt like a big time pay-per-view. It wasn't even in Mexico. It was in Las Vegas. They beat Canelo to the punch. They secured T-Mobile arena, historically Las Vegas on Mexican independence day weekend. That's a spot where the greatest Mexican fighters play. That is when the biggest fights happen and they beat them to the punch and they, on the weekend. Mixed martial arts, which, you know, five, six years ago didn't really have much of a presence in Mexico. Now you have a card which was essentially Mexico versus the world. This should be celebrated. This should be acknowledged. I watched that and I was like, 
man, this was, I, I was, I was, I was enamored. I was intoxicated by it. Honestly, I turned off that broadcast on Saturday and dumbfounded, a bit shocked, all that stuff about the scoring. But I felt, I felt like this, this romanticism in my heart. This is why I loved it because I'll be honest, it has been trying at times. It has been trying to watch these apex. The apex events are are one a.m. ESPN two kickboxing matches. They they don't feel like anything. They don't feel big. They don't feel important. It feels like the McDonaldization of MMA. It's all rinse and repeat. Let's just get it out on the conveyor belt. Oh, what do you want? A Happy Meal? You want a Big Mac? You want a Quarter Pounder? It's all the same. Saturday did not feel like the same. And I hope, I pray that they do this each and every year. Obviously, September 16th isn't always going to fall on a Saturday, but do it that weekend. If it has to be in Vegas, great. If it could be in Mexico, even better. If we could recreate this model, and I know it's not easy, but like I said last week, if we can go to France on Bastille Day weekend, if we can go to Ireland on St. Patrick's Day weekend, if we can be in Canada on July 1st, I know it can't always be this way, but if we could do it, more than once, amazing. If it's just going to be Noche UFC on a Mexican Independence Day weekend, amazing. They've earned it. They deserved it. And by God, they freaking showed out. We weren't even in Mexico. It felt like we were in Mexico. It was spectacular. I loved everything about it. I really did. And they deserve all the credit. And I can't even imagine what it would have been like if they had El Pantera and Brandon Moreno and Brian Ortega. I hope you all felt the same about that card as I did. Uh, it, it has been a while, like we've had great events. Let's not kid ourselves. Australia has been fantastic. Canada, Vancouver, but there was something about that that just felt unique. The packages, that Gilbert Melendez package, I loved. Shout out to him and my guy Gonzo from uh, from ESPN. They put that together about the history of that weekend and what it means for fight sports. Like God, I am such a sucker for combat sports history. When when the UFC leans in just a bit. It's, it's beautiful. They don't do it enough, in my opinion. And I would love to see them do it more. And Saturday, they did it a lot. And so everyone deserves credit from the broadcast team to the production team to the fighters to the promoters. Everyone deserves credit. Well done. I tip my, 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 my virtual cap to you. So I loved it. I can't say that enough. And, uh, you know, please clip this off and send it to all the people who say I'm too negative. Anyway, but then we get to the main event. And the card was great. Big time performances ups, downs for the Mexican fighters, but you know, it was, it was very entertaining, great moments. That main event could not have delivered any better. I thought it was better than the first fight and the first fight was great, but the first fight, they were bit players to John Jones and Cyril Gan. I mean, they, they were more chief support than co if you get what I'm saying. Saturday, they were the main event and it was Alexa Grasso's first title defense and was Valentina Shevchenko looking like an absolute killer. Like when she walked into the arena, when they showed that arrival shot, she looked like the Terminator. She looked like someone who was out there to do very, very bad things. Like she looked so determined and it was great. It upped the intensity. And then the fight could not have delivered any better. It was better than I thought. It was one of the most entertaining women's title fights that I've ever seen. Certainly one of the most entertaining 25 minute women's fights, title fight or not that I've ever seen. They deserve so much credit for what they produced, how they fought, the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows, the highs and lows. One minute, it seems like Grasso's going to get a knockout or a TKO. Then you think Shevchenko's going to get a submission. Then it's, It was never boring. It was never dull. It was pure magic. It was theater. It was great. It couldn't have delivered any better. In the end, you watch that, and I think most people agree with me, you think that Valentina Shevchenko won that fight. To me, it wasn't all that controversial. Alexa fought valiantly. She was amazing in the moment. First defense against the legend, the greatest of all time at 125. But in the end, I felt like she fell just a little bit short. 48-47, I thought she won round two and four. And they were close rounds. No, excuse me, two and five. Valentina, I thought, won one, three, four. We go to the scorecards. I see the second belt come out. Interesting, because we had heard that Valentina doesn't win the second belt. You see it in the background. And in the end, it ends up being a split draw. So Alexa Grasso retains the belt. And you start scratching your head and you start thinking, how was that possible just from a mathematics standpoint? There was no 10-8. 
How did it end up being a split draw? Well, then you start to think, well, probably there is a 10-8, and then you start to think, like, which round is a 10-8, and then the scorecards come out. And then you see that Mike Bell, who historically is a, is a fine judge who doesn't slip up a lot, scored the fifth round 10-8 for Lex Grasso. Had he scored it 10-9, Valentina Shevchenko, right this second, is the new, once again, women's flyweight champion. This might feel hyperbolic, but I do feel like that is one of the worst and indefensible scorecards for a specific round that we have ever seen. We have seen some bad ones. Lord knows we have seen some bad ones. Patty Pimblett and Jared Gordon was a bad one. We've seen some bad ones in the last few months. 10 eights are so unique and have to be so one sided and so dominant in this sport as opposed to boxing. Where if you get a knockdown, it's a 10-8. In this sport, for five minutes, you have to be so dominant to get a 10-8. That was not a 10-8 round. In fact, you could make a stronger case for Valentina winning the fifth, in my opinion, than Alexa getting a 10-8 fifth round. That's how bad that scorecard was. And you wonder if he was trying to even it out, if he was trying, he was like, hmm, I should have given her this, so let me try to figure. I don't know what it is. In fact, let me just check. No, I didn't want to come on here and just wax poetic and say, this is what they should do. I didn't want to come on here and say, there needs to be accountability and we need to hear from Mike Bell. We've heard from Valentina. We've heard from Alexa. We would have heard from Dana, but apparently he was on vacation. How that is possible. I have no idea why the vacation can't be like, you know, on Monday to Thursday. Like it's such a huge night, but whatever. I digress. This shouldn't be about that. We, we hear from everyone and we can talk to everyone in the aftermath. Why can't we talk to the one person who impacted this, who literally changed the course of history? Valentina Shevchenko would be champion. Her life is different as a result of that. We can't talk to that person, but we can talk to everyone else. They shield him from us. There is zero accountability. So I didn't want to come on here and say the same thing that I've said before, because again, I don't want to be repetitive and redundant. So I reached out to Nevada. I reached out to Jeff Mullen, who's the big boss over there in Nevada, the Nevada State Athletic Commission. And I asked for an interview. I asked for an interview with him. I asked for an interview with, with Mike Bell. I'm not trying to, like, if Mike Bell showed up at the press conference on Saturday, what do they think? Do you think people would have showed up with, like, pitchforks? Come on. We're not, like, this isn't the big, bad New York media. People would have asked him a few questions, and he would have went on his merry way. And I guarantee you there'd be less sort of criticism and negativity, I think. Maybe I'm being naive on this Monday. Same with if he came on this show. We just want an explanation. We just want to understand the thought process. We don't get that, so we have to start hypothesizing. It's silly, it's stupid, it's backwards. So I reached out to him and I asked, you or, or, or Mike, come on, no. Uh, never really got a response. Said that they were weighing their options. Fair, okay. It doesn't have to, you're like, listen, it's not time, it's not time, maybe on Wednesday, maybe they talk to someone else. God bless, it doesn't have to be on this show. We would just love an explanation. Try to get uh, an opportunity to get a statement holding out hope that, that may happen, but not holding my breath. The system is, is created to protect the judges for whatever reason. You're in a public position where there's a lot at stake, but yet everyone can face the music but you. We need to know, the world needs to know, the public needs to know, the promotion needs to know, the fighters need to know, Valentina Shevchenko in particular needs to know why this was scored at 10-8. I watched that post-fight press conference on Saturday and she made a case. She even talked about those knees with her hand down. She's wrong about the hand down thing. The one hand down thing isn't a thing anymore. That's not a rule. But I was like, holy shit, this is one of the best women's flyweight fighters, one of the best champions of UFC history and she, even she doesn't understand the rules. They don't do a good enough job of educating the fighters. Everyone's going in there blind. There needs to be seminars. There needs to be education. There needs to be some sort of explanation especially in these moments. But what they hope is, move on, event on Saturday, he'll be right back in that chair. No, there needs to be accountability. There needs to be perhaps a timeout, a suspect. I don't know, but I would love to hear why. And honestly, I would love to hear, maybe he comes on and says, you know what? I fucked up. I made a mistake. I screwed up. That's a 10-9. She won the round, but not 10-8. That's my bad. I'm human. I am sorry. I would be okay with that. Or he comes on and says, look, she did this for that. 
she had this position, she did this damage, and then we have to take, now we sit here and we all start waxing poetic and we all start doing our thing. And it's just, it's backwards. Like I said, in, in football, in basketball, in baseball, when there are controversial calls, there is some sort of system in place where you get some kind of explanation. Does it always suffice? No. But I'll tell you what, it's way freaking better than what we have here. It's way freaking better. So I'm holding out hope. I hope and I will continue to bang this drum. It is backwards. It makes no sense. And I will continue to bang this drum. That 10-8 was egregious. It's one of the worst scorecards in the history of this sport. You can't, you can't do that in the fifth round of a title fight with so much at stake. You can't with no accountability, no repercussions whatsoever. And, and I've been the one, I even said it after the first fight, I said, maybe they go in a different direction. Maybe they do Alexa versus someone else. And then they revisit Valentina if she wins a fight. Like maybe at this point, you can't do that. You cannot do that. She was screwed on Saturday. They have to run it back. Trust me, I'm as tired of the running it backs as all of you. But you can't do it like this. She won that fight. It's not like she slipped and didn't do enough and got the opportunity and, and now she has to deal with the repercussions. She won that fight. She won that fight. And I love Alexa Grasso. She's one of my favorite fighters to watch. She's one of my favorite fighters. This is no knock on her. It was close. It was amazing. God bless. You know, she can have an incredible run. Like, she deserves everything she gets. How could you not be a fan of her? But if we're keeping it real, Valentina won that fight 48-47. At worst. Can you make a case for 49 47 But I think it was 48-47. And so you have to run it back. The one sort of saving grace for the people who think that there are too many rematches and trilogies is that she unfortunately broke her thumb. And so maybe that will allow the division to evolve a little bit. Maybe you go with Blanchfield. Maybe you go with Furo. And then she gets the title shot. Valentina's next fight should be for the 125-pound belt. Does it have to be next? No. And maybe that's the saving grace. But the next time she fights, it has to be for 125, in my opinion, because of what happened. I would love to hear from Mike Bell. I would love to hear from Jeff Mullen. I wouldn't hate it if I heard from the UFC as well. But people need to talk in these situations. They need to speak up because this only hurts the sport. On an amazing night for the sport, quite frankly, on an amazing week for the sport, these are the things that hurt boxing. When people started to lose trust in the sport, oh, wait, the Mexican fighter won on, you know, Noche UFC because they're building the PI and they do this. They're like, you can't allow that to creep in. I don't believe there was any sort of conspiracy, foul play involved at all. But you can't let that start to creep in because once it does, it's hard to regain that trust. And so I'm fascinated to see where they go here. I'm fascinated to see how the particulars involved deal with it. I hope they speak up. I'm going to monitor my phone. I'm going to see if maybe someone will, will prove me right and, and speak up and give me something. Nothing yet, but I'm trying. And I don't have it. Like, this is not coming from a malicious place to Mike Bell. We all make mistakes. That was a mistake. I would love to know if he agrees with that sentiment. Let me ask the guys. Am I, am I wrong? A in my scorecard. Does anyone out there Disagree with my 48-47 for Valentina Shevchenko. GC rocking the uh, Mexican. Is that an Ortega? What is that? A Choa? What do we got there? No, no, no. No name on the back. Okay. Just, just the Mexican jersey. Uh, when it comes to the scorecard, so I thought you could have scored round four uh, for either fighter, which would have made it 48-47. I mean, when, when we were about to go to the scorecards, I was literally pacing back and forth. Uh, at the party I was at, and I was just like, who, who'd who they give round four to? Because uh, obviously Alexa Grasso had the moments with the knees. I know Valentina argued them, but but they were legal. Uh, but then Valentina had moments in that round as well. I mean, obviously the elbow that cut her open, cut Grasso open above the eye. So, like, it was a tough round to score. Watching it live, I scored it for Valentina. Then round five of 10, nine for Grasso, 48, 47 Valentina. But I, I see where, like, uh, online a lot of people are scoring it 48, 47 Grasso which I can see if you gave her round four, but the 10-8 the is, just, is just indefensible. I'd, There's a lot of people scoring at 48-47 Grasso. Oh, yeah, yeah. Quite a, quite a few people I'm seeing wow. saying 48-47 Maybe I'm Grasso. in a... Uh, in an it, all, it all just comes down to, to the fourth round. Round one and three, clear for Valentina. Round two and five, clear for Grasso. And then it comes down to that fourth one. The 10-8, the how we got to the draw is what makes it so frustrating. Rick? Nope, don't hear you. 
Don't hear. Oh, wow. Now, now we actually have a, a broken button. Wow. See if I hold it. Can yeah, you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's I lovely. had a 48, 47 uh, Shevchenko. Yeah. But I could definitely see a 48, 47 Grasso. I think that's a perfectly defensible scorecard. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the argument today would have been over that scoring if we had not gotten the round five, 10, eight. That's right. A, that, that's a good point. That I, becomes the conversation. And that's why I think when you're like, oh, maybe I'm in an echo chamber, I actually think it's just more that people are more upset about that. And that has become the debate point. Um, otherwise, I think this conversation would have been solely focused on, well, Valentina didn't really win. Grasso won 48 47. And there would have been a lot more conversation around that. Uh, but the 10 8 just absolved us of that conversation. And now that is the focus of everything. Uh, but I personally did have a 48-47 for Shevchenko. No, that that is 100%. Like, I, that's why I don't want to come out too aggressive because I don't want this to seem like it was a close fight. It was a oh, close yeah. fight Very in the close. sense that both are evenly matched. Both fought their hearts out. Like, it was just so entertaining. That fight was so freaking good. That will be on the short list for... Uh, let's take Rick off the screen here while he's uh, dealing with this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that, that fight is going to be on the shortlist for fight of the year. It's going to be on the shortlist for fight of the year. Um, it doesn't matter if it's women's MMA or, or, or men's MMA. And so I don't want it to see. It could be a 48-47 for both. For now. But I hear you. I hear you, uh, Rick. I hear you. Um, I, I I just feel like, you, to your point, Rick, the 10-8 clouds everything. It, 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 it really... It sours everything, and that's why I feel like you have to run it back, or at least you have to guarantee Valentina. If she can't, if she can't fight in January or or February, like it's gonna be like their last fight was six months ago, so it's only like she has to fight tomorrow. If she can't fight whenever they want to have the next title fight, because we all know that's the way it goes. It's it's not necessarily like who's next; it's who's available when they want to have the fight. Just witness what happened two weeks ago with Sean Strickland then I'm fine with them giving it to Furo or Blanchfield. And that's another set of can of worms because I know both of them think that they are next. The question is, does Valentina get to right that wrong whenever she is ready? What do you guys think that they should do? GC? Uh, I'm with you what, you, what you were saying earlier. Like you, you have to do the rematch now. However much you want to see it or not, I'm, I'm not even sure if I want to see it. As great as that fight was, you know, obviously seeing the, the title fight being the same matchup for the third time in a row. But like, like you said... It it was a draw. You you have to run it back. Uh, whether Grasso retains, like like she said to DC in the post fight interview, DC was right. It was a draw. You you have to afford that to Valentina Shevchenko. Rick, I don't know if you're. Uh... I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yep. Um, if Manon Fioro or Aaron Blanchfield had given a performance that was undeniable, my feeling would be different probably. But because they had, because they didn't. Uh, I don't see any reason that you don't do this again. And I, I don't even think of it from the perspective of, like, it was a draw, so you must. For starters, both fights were amazing, and these two are very clearly evenly matched, and these two are very clearly um, the right foils for each other. So even on that basis alone, and I've long said this before, like, I was one who said, do Figueredo versus Moreno until we can't stomach them anymore, and they did. Um, I would do the same here. This this fight feels like the fight that needs to be made at flyweight, and I would do it until there's a definitive outcome where we say, okay, we've we've seen enough from this uh, series of fights. This this feels like you do it again. And I'm typically not the immediate rematch person, but this just feels like it has the, the so, secret uh, sauce. So I, I feel like the uh, rematch or trilogy is as much, if not more, of a controversial take than anything we've said about the scoring. Like, I saw a lot of people who are like, please, not again. Enough of the rematch. And, uh, and I, know, I don't know if this is on the back end of Sean Strickland, is he talk? But I don't know how you can deny Valentina. Tied. Another, right? You're tied. You have to do but it again. He, here's the thing. Forget all that. Forget all the, the, the hoopla around that. These two fights were amazing. Amazing. Like these, these are the best fights we're getting at women's flyweight. Why would you not want this fight again? If, if that is your argument, you don't care about the fight part of it. And that's fine. If, if you're going to come out and say, I don't care about the fight part of it, I don't want to see a rematch, fine. I'm not judging you. You, you. you can take that stance. But if you care about the actual product, if you care about the fights, this is the best of what we're getting. Why would we not want to see it again? I don't understand that. No, it was that amazing. I, I really, I don't know. What, what is the front runner for fight of the year? Off the top of my head, I don't know. I feel like I should know this. But this, this to me has to be in like the top five, right? 
I I am, I'm very bad at remembering. Yeah, the, I need to look at what's list. happened. I'm getting caught off guard. Right um, now. probably it's if it's not top five, it's top ten. I I really don't feel comfortable because I have no memory of it, of any of it. Um, but what what else would you rather like from a fight perspective? I understand if you're somebody who says I want to see Aaron Blanchfield get her shot, or you're somebody who says I want to see Manon Farrow get her shot. Sure, great, no argument from me. But why does it have to be now? Why does it have to be next? And and again, I'm typically in camp. Don't need to see it run back, but this one needs to be run back. What is the what is the hesitation? By the way, Tapology uh, does like a running list. Yeah. So this is their top five as of right now for 2023. Um, Makhachev versus Volkanovski, obviously That's tremendous. A February feels like a long ass time ago, right? Uh, Moreno Pantoja three back in July. Really good one. Gechi Fiziev. Oh, yeah, that was a great one. Neil Rachmanov. Yep. Hooker Turner. Yep. Tashara Hill. Gaslam Curtis. This is this is above those, in my opinion. This is this is some of those were they were great. I I was captivated from beginning to end of that fight because of the stakes, because of the atmosphere, but because of the actual freaking action. They were incredible. Both of them were incredible. There were so many moments where it looked like it was about to get finished for yeah. for both fighters. Like when she dropped Valentina, uh, and it looked like Valentina was seriously hurt even after she had gotten up from getting dropped. Like I, I thought it was about to get called. Uh, and then she took her back, and I thought there was going to be a submission. Uh, and then Valentina locked in the guillotine. I thought it was going to get finished there. Uh, and then in the fifth round, I thought we were about to get another one of those that we saw so many times in 2022, the, the fifth round finish. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was an incredible fight. This is the like again, if if there was a contender who had stamped it and said, "I need to be in this fight," I I can hear that argument. I absolutely can. But have we seen that? Do you feel like there's somebody at flyweight who has said, "I need to be fighting for the title no matter what next"? I personally don't. Okay, well, here's the so this is a great question. Here's the thing. Valentina might be out for a considerable amount of time. She has a broken thumb. We'll, we'll get an update, hopefully, from her when she joins us at yeah. 2.30. I can't wait, and I give her a lot of credit um, and appreciate very much that she's joining us. If she can fight, and they want Grasso to fight in January, February, whatever, it has to come down to Furo or Blanchfield. You can't have sure. them fight at that point. Then the question is, who is it? Because I feel like they're neck and neck. Like Maybe I would say Furo has the most high-profile win because Rose is Rose. But in terms of like... Does, does Grasso have to fight then? Is my question. Is that well? Is that, you're canceling them out. You want them to fight each other. Yeah. Blanchfield and Furo. At this point. Yeah, it, I do. Yeah. I want them as a co-main to to Valentina and Grasso. No, through. but my point is, what if Valentina is out for a while? How long is a while? Okay. The so good news is, is that Furo just fought, and so did Blanchfield. Yeah. yeah. If within the last Look, month. If this becomes, and we talked about this when we were talking about what's next for Izzy, what's next for Sean. If this becomes a situation where it's a calendar booking, right? And all of a sudden, Grasso needs to fight and we need a, a flyweight challenger. There's two good options right there. No problem. Find out who who's available and let's do it. But if you're asking me what should be the fight, what fight I actually want to see, what fight makes the most sense, it's the trilogy fight. There's no doubt in my mind. And and it to me, it would be worth holding Alexa Grasso for it. It would be worth saying... Let's do this fight next. Trilogy fight in Mexico? Yeah. What, what's bigger oh than that? Oh, my God. Sign me up. So now, good. granted, if you put Alexa Grasso in Mexico against any of these people, it would do well, right? But this one has the heat. This one has the story. There's there's not a reason to rush past it, in my opinion. I agree. And and there are reasons in other divisions to not, right? I'm, I'm not particularly interested in Israel and Sean again. Mm. We saw a one-sided blanking, like, okay, let's move on. I'm fine with that. This one doesn't have that same feeling for me. Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest difference from last week to this week. Yeah, one it was a one-sided affair, Sean Strickland, dog, dizzy. Uh, and in this one, it was a draw. It was a tie. Got to run it back. If they, also, my question is, if they want to do a title fight, who deserves it more? Who gets the nod? Who, with, don't don't do Fier, semantics. With Fierro and Blanchfield? On yes, yes. You I'm, flip a coin. Yeah. Who gets the nod? Who do you, who Blanchfield do we will get it. You think so? Yeah. Probably. Why? She seems to have a little bit more star power than. Yeah, Fiero. she has a little more juice. She speaks fan, English. Bigger fan yeah. base. There's a, there's a lot of people that love Aaron Blanchfield. No, I know. I just didn't know. Like, because because you can argue, right? right. Fiero has the highest profile win, right? Yeah, but is that is that how title fights are made anymore? No, no. I'm saying if they're both ready, 
who do we DDP think has got the highest who profile do we win? Are we UFC, sure that he's about no, no, to get no, no, the title no, no. shot? Forget all that. Not. Forget all that. I'm just saying, who do you think the UFC picks? If it's like, okay, Blanchfield. probably Blanchfield. Yeah, I, I would, I would lean Blanchfield. By the way, why not Tracy Cortez? She beat Blanchfield. Just yeah. Kidding. Wow. Just now we're really getting into it. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, that was a very controversial fight. I know. I know. I know. I know. I'm kidding. But imagine many years, moons ago. Imagine Cortez versus uh, Grasso in Mexico. I mean, you That'd could do crazy. worse. Yeah. But but again. The right, the rightful answer for this is Valentina Shevchenko. A thousand percent. Because of what we've seen in these two fights. Again, we keep... The sport has a tendency to do it because of how it's constructed at the moment, but we are getting away from the fact that these two have been in the cage together and produced magic both times. Magic. Like, these, these are incredible fights. And that, at the heart of it, is probably something the UFC should lean into. What a fight. Honestly, it's, like, it's, it's amazing to see Grosso's evolution... Like to oh, see yeah. that she has that dog in her that she can like go to like a, we I, I I think I texted this to you guys like it's refreshing to finally see Valentina in a war right like because it was so dominant it was so one sided they were so predictable her fights and that's all her right like she she's just so brilliant and she was so much better than the division for such a long time so to see her go through these ebbs and flows and to see someone like Grasso who've been watching for a while and we didn't quite know if she would live up to the expectations to see her dig down deep bloody fighting back dodging bullets right like moments where you think that she's going to actually falter moments where she looks like she's going to finish valentina in the early goings of the round like uh, of the fight just amazing can i just say that that over one and a half was dicey it <laughs> yeah. was dicey let's not go there i don't even want to talk about that <laughs> can we give valentina the same credit because uh, i feel like the narrative around these has re very recently been like fighters of a certain age, fighters who have been champion for this long, all those things. It would have been very easy for Valentina Shevchenko to lay down. It would have been very easy for her to say, my legacy is assured and not um, recover from that second round. And instead, what we saw is Valentina Shevchenko stick in there on many people's scorecards, win the fight. I think she deserves as the same praise which you have for Alexa Grasso, which is absolutely warranted, I think also belongs on Valentina Shevchenko for being somebody who has been champion for that long, could have taken their eye off the ball, could have been safe with their legacy, and just gotten out of there. She fought back as hard as anybody fights back and looked incredible. So I think yeah. both of them deserve that kind of praise, that kind of accolade for the fights that they're producing. And why would you not want to see this again? I don't understand. Who? Who is out there? Why? Ah, I saw some people being enough, enough. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's you saw those people, division. right? Yeah, it's clogged up. You know, let's move We've been on. begging for this for so uh, long, for flyweight fights that matter, that are interesting. I know. We've been begging, and now we have it, and they're like, eh, okay. I mean, Ariel, to your point, like, less than a year ago when it was her and Arujo in the main event, I remember just being like, all right, Gross is probably going to go out there, just outpoint her to a right. decision, yeah, and that's going to be that. Now she's like sending Valentina all the way across the <laughs> octagon, <laughs> dropping her like it it's looks crazy. like fucking Brock Lesnar and Heath Herring. No, it's it amazing. Great. By the way, uh, do you, do you guys share my sentiment um, uh, regarding regarding the event, what they pulled off on? Oh, Saturday? my God, it was amazing. It was amazing. The crowd, I love the theme. Every once in a while we're getting the, the Noche UFC logo popping up. Like I loved the, uh, like the packages that they were rolling throughout it. Uh, yeah, it was fantastic. It felt special, uh, especially having a, a title fight on a fight night. It it was awesome. I, I believe you alluded to something like this in our chat. Like it felt like a pay per view. Yeah, it felt oh, like it a big like a event. Like this was this was the thing that everybody was watching. And the numbers, like I I, I mean, they're used to now getting you know six million dollar gates. Like they got a two plus million dollar gate and eighteen thousand people for a, a fight night that was an ESPN Plus card at T-Mobile. Like, there was a part of me that was like, hmm, I wonder if they're going to fill it up. Uh, looked like they filled it up. <laughs> yeah, looked right? like they did not even struggle to fill it up. Yeah, it looked like the fans were super into it. And, and again, imagine if Ortega, Pantera, or Moran, even one of those guys were added to that card. I feel like it would have just been same attendance, ticket prices up, and you just you ride it. It's weird how this card and the Australia card um, are both tied in a weird way to July 8th. Because I feel like it, it, had they kept Moreno, mm. for just like they kept, you know, some of those Australian guys. For, you know what I mean? They loaded. Yeah, but they loaded that July eighth card with with players that affected these last two events. Yeah. It, it'll, everything yeah. works out for the UFC. It's amazing. They can they can make like a a blunder here and there, and it always seems to end. The only time it's not worked out was the Diaz situation of last year. 
every other time, even when they zig and that. they should have zagged, it always feels like it works out in their favor. The house always seems to win. I mean, they, they are. And that worked out, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Did it? Yeah. Do you, what, do you how did it w? not? Like, what, what, what's the big downfall from that? What's the big uh, downside? They, I mean, nothing in the business. Nothing. It worked out. No, but they fine. were trying to hurt him on the way out. To they were honest, trying to lower his stock on the way out. Sure, but I mean, ultimately they didn't. But now uh, life moves on. The only, the the real one losing situation from that is that we haven't seen Hamzat since. That, and, but again, that's kind of like out of control, out of the yeah, control. Yeah, like do with that. That's yeah. the that's the real. But honestly, they're they're bulletproof at this point. They are absolutely Teflon. I mean, these last five weeks have been unbelievable. You got yep. Boston, Sean O'Malley winning. Uh, Singapore, Korean zombie moment. Uh, Paris with Cyril Gaon coming back. Australia, Sean Strickland gets the belt, and now Noche UFC. Like the last five weeks have been, have been unbelievable. Now I think we get uh, back to the apex. I think three straight apex. Yeah, cards. Uh, is off. it three? Let's yeah, go. Oh. Well, it's yeah, it's this weekend, and then it's uh, off a, week. bi a bye week. Yeah, a rare yeah. one, and then and it's then two, two straight. Huh? Yeah, because October what first, and then the yeah. N next big big one is uh, is two ninety four. In Abu Dhabi. Damn. And then we're like it's, right around the corner of MSG. Kind of, yeah, kind of what happens every year though. There's yeah, they, they go lull. they go light. They go light for college football. I think that's an year yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh Lad Dumont. We got we yeah, got that yeah. a couple October yeah. ago. There was a can't Marina can't Rodriguez. Uh, yeah, Marina Rodriguez. Uh Dern Yan. That was uh the October yeah. cards are always legendary. I uh yeah, I I, I hope they keep doing it. And I really think that they could they can make this into a thing, and they can make the entire card Mexico versus the world, or you know, I'm down Mexican American, like the JDM Kevin Holland one. As fun as it did, kind of feel like a little bit out it of felt place. Out of place, one hundred percent, no doubt. It was like I think it was also exacerbated by the idea that like everybody was like, this is going to be the banger of all bangers. I love this fight, and it was kind of just like a good fight. It wasn't like the 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 wild crazy kind of um, thing that maybe it had been hyped up to be. If that went off, if that was just an absolute crazy fight, I think it would have felt a little more in place on the card. But yeah, it did it did stand out for sure. Thanks for watching. We appreciate it very much. Hey, if you like this video, give us the old thumbs up. Subscribe as well. You can get many more of these videos on the channel. So please do that. We would love you forever if you did so.